had companions ask me while in the jungle why they didn't see more of the wildlife. It's there, but at war, the war of appetites, there is every kind of trick to hide from enemies. Many of the smaller combatants are dressed up in a way to fool the other fellow. The most remarkable creature in the tropics along these lines is the walking leaf of Ceylon. It's a near living leaf in every sense of the word. Vivid green, veined like a leaf, even the limbs like small leaves with wrinkled edges. And it rocks and sways like a leaf in the breeze. The walking stick has the same idea, only its shape is a bit different, like a thin twig, and it can do a wiggly little dance like the leaf insect. There are many kinds like this in the tropics. Curiously enough, the mimicry of a stick has been imitated by another insect that lives beneath the surface of stagnant lakes and is called the water stick. Insects breathe through discs in the side of the body. This fellow doesn't take chances in sticking the body out of the water. It has an air tube and just pokes the end of this above the surface, like a periscope. But one of the stars of these stick imitators is the mantis, known as the praying mantis, owing to the way he bunches in a crouch. With stick-like legs at various angles, the mantis is anything but easy to see if in a brushy place, and he uses the deception to evil purpose. He isn't timid or trying to dodge the other fellow in his twig-like makeup. He is dis a disguised enemy waiting to take the passerby for a ride. Here is the only insect that can give you an insolent and intense stare, that can turn its head, that is alleged to practically hypnotize its victims. A silly grasshopper has no idea of the nature of such a motionless stick-like form before it. Whole chapters and stories have been written about the mantis, which has been called the world's strangest insect. Unlike other insects, it may be fed by human hand without it showing the least fear, and it seizes its prey with the ferocity of a panther. Here is a grasshopper that intends to dodge trouble. In mimicry, the rock grasshopper is a match for the surfaces on which it basks, and mimicry is a common kind of protection. Tree toads match and blend with the bark and lichens on which they live, not only in color, but in texture and mottling of the skin. I've almost had my nose on them before I found them. And that brings us to the point why some of the fur animals are brown in the summer and white in winter. The hair turns white with the first cold weather and sticks close to the early patches of snow. Among the great sand drifts of the desert, you'll find all sorts of little spiky plants. And if you are hunting for horned toads, which are really desert lizards, you look among little patches of cactus plants where the toads are hiding. They shuffle the sand over their backs and leave only their spiky heads peeking out. It's hard to tell which is a toad or a sprouting cactus. You take a stick and dig under little mounds of sand or what may appear like small cacti. I've dug one out, but failed to see another a few inches away until it happened to move its head in keeping an eye on me. Then again, they are hard to see even in the open. As they bask, flatten to the ground, and their hue is the same as that of the desert sand. Hues of pink or of yellow, precisely matching the sand. There is a kind that has a perfect crown of sharp spines. Thus the game of make-believe is carried on in the jungle, the deserts, and in the sea, where the masquerade is even more remarkable. But let us get right down to the reason for all this. Imagine a small crab very much out of luck, attacked by a 20-pound filefish. The rock crab has always worried about these strong-jawed fish. He lives in a bad neighborhood. There are many dark alleys. He has always fitted a dead sponge to his back, a tough old sponge with a big dent in it, and what 
fish would think of swallowing a sponge. But he has grown fat, and the sponge he was wearing kept popping off like a hat in a breeze, and tide currents are like the wind. This sponge has a good dent, but it's quite a job to jam it over a fellow's back. However, it looks like a good fit, and thus disguised he can dare that file fish to choke in swallowing such a mouthful. Isn't that smart? They are wiser than you think. Such enemies as the big file fish have taught the hermit crab to seek an empty shell, jam his body within it, then carry the defensive armor around with him. Sort of a walking tank arrangement. He outgrows and discards an old shell, then shops around for a new one. Of two empty shells, one may be too tight for chest expansion. Then again, another may look better. I think I'll take this one, ruminates the crab, feeling that once he is outfitted with such tough covering, he can play around anywhere and duck into the shell if he sees any trouble coming his way. Under the surface of the very seas where we sailed, our camouflage ships lives the original camouflage artist, the cuttlefish. He can go a several points better by being blotched one minute and striped the next. You may remember how we striped our warships like zebras or broke their outlines by big splotches of color? That is camouflage. The breaking or confusing of marginal lines so an object is difficult to determine. The cuttlefish in changing its pattern is astonishing. The changes take place right in front of your eyes, blotches or stripes coming or going. You say the zebra effect seems to be one of his favorite designs. It's one of the best to break outlines, but they are liable to swing into a pebble pattern to match the coarse sand to the bottom, a combination of camouflage and mimicry. But there are keen eyes in the sea, an enemy may know the tricks in advance. Then comes the star play, the smoke screen, jets of sepia from special glands, he clouds the path of advance with the inky fluid. With the screen laid down, the murk spreads, and into this he darts and zigzags and escape. And humans only started to utilize these ancient means a few years past.